Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is provided by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1948. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 119, A Brace of Interviews. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard champion office. <laughs> The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger shooter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! It's time, it's time, it's time! Once again, for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder. And we are so delighted that you've taken the time out of your own busy schedule. And we don't care whether that schedule means working, taking care of small children, helping the elderly, or maybe just lounging and idling as you do every day. We're just glad that you're here. Or taking care of elderly small children that you put to work. <laughs> and we hope uh, that, that you're kind to animals wherever you go. Yes. Always remember, friends, the motto of the I Hear of Sherlock team, which is, it's an hour of your life. You'll never get back. <laughs> uh, well, you know, before editing, it's much longer than that. So, well, that's uh, true. Uh, we're we're doing you a service, folks. We we are. I don't think. Oh, go ahead. Thank us. Go ahead. <laughs> it could be a lot worse. That's all I'm saying. It, it, we sure. we are but, saving you from spending even more time with us. That's right. It's bad enough as it is. That's right. And so the game's afoot. <laughs> hey, well, hey, that's our opinion. But what about what about your opinion? Are are we are we overboarding? Would you like to hear more? Would you like to hear less? Let us know. Leave us are a comment wa- on the are we website. Waterboarding. Yeah. What what's that? Are we waterboarding? No. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Uh, leave us a comment at uh, IHearOfSherlock.com on the website there. Show notes are available for this episode at iHose.co slash iHose one one nine. Uh, you can certainly email us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. You can hit us up on Twitter or Facebook, the two social networks where we spend most of our time. Uh, you can find us there at I Hear of Sherlock. And uh, what else? Oh, the, that, 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 that thing us. with numbers. Yeah. How does that work? That's 774 read You just find the old rotary dial. Put your finger in the seven, wind it all the way around clockwise and let it go. And do that a couple more times, 774-221-7323, and leave us a message. It's amazing how that works. <clears throat> well, aside from messages from you, we'd like to t- take the time to share with you this message from our sponsor. <laughs> Friends, it's time to celebrate May Day the Pagan Way in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex. That means joining the Wessex Morris men and their ancient dawn ritual to welcome in the spring. But you don't need bells on your legs to consult a curious collection of dates through the year with Sherlock Holmes. It highlights every day with canonical and historical events from the Sherlockian universe an almanac, an encyclopedia, and more. 
an array of research, commentary, and obscure facts assembled by Leah Gwynn and Jamie Mahoney. Oh, give us pleasure in the flowers today, in the orchard white, like ghosts by night, in happy bees that swarm round perfect trees. Spring is the perfect time to reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. Always a delight. Well, we are not here to simply listen to Bert Wax Poetic about Wes Express. Although, I'll tell you, if you haven't taken the time to listen to our ads, please do. Not, not only because it's important to support our sponsors because they support us, but each each time we put one of these sponsor messages together, we take the time to handcraft it. These are handcrafted <laughs> messages, folks. You know how handcrafted cocktails are a big thing right now, particularly with the uh, uh, with, with the millennial set, with, with the hipsters? Uh, well, these are handcrafted ads, and uh, we take the time to make each one fresh and new each episode. So do take a moment and listen to what it is that we're saying, particularly Bert's poetic uh, potential there in, in each <laughs> Wes Express ad. And it's so consistent with trends in popular culture today. Friends, we live in an age when everything is coming back. Beards, tattoos, vinyl <laughs> records. Why not the 11th century? Uh, it, it seems perfectly appropriate. And uh, just I mean, every one of these podcasts, we have to fly over to Britain, find out what's going on in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex. It's a lot of effort, but you are worth it. Hmm. That is true. Well, we, as threatened, do have a brace of interviews. So brace yourselves. Uh, in this case, we are uh, taking our inspiration from uh, the canon itself. When Holmes mentioned that he had oysters and a brace of grouse, uh, I believe that was in, oh, what story was that in? Sign of Four. Is that, uh, does that sound familiar? Um, the end of... Uh, what chapter was that? Uh, I'm going to go right up here and say it's chapter nine, a break in the chain. It mm. ends with, um, well, you are a master of the situation. I have had no proof yet of the existence of this Jonathan Small. However, if you can catch him, I don't see how I can refuse you an interview with him. That, of course, is Athelney Jones. And Holmes says, that is understood then? Perfectly. Is there anything else? Only that I insist upon your dining with us. It will be ready in half an hour. I have oysters and a brace of grouse, with something a little choice in white wines. Watson, you have never yet recognized my merits as a housekeeper. <laughs> so, See, one... when I was very young and read that for the first time, I misread it, and I thought he was grousing about braces. <laughs> so for the longest while, I thought he just had bad orthodonture. <laughs> <laughs> braces of grass. Well, maybe this is something that we need to discuss over in trifles uh, before we get to our brace of interviews. Um, mm. A brace of grouse is is a pair. It's two grouse. Or is that grice? Well, uh, no, no, that's the grice Patterson case. That's one of the apocryphal <laughs> cases. <laughs> Boy, we are, I don't know how many more tangents we can find ourselves on at this point. Um that leads to a question: Is a brace of grouse enough for enough to feed three people, or would Watson and Holmes have required their own grouse each? I I just think this is completely. This is one of these things like people wearing black armbands when Holmes <laughs> fell off the Reichenbach. I don't think there's any support for it. First of all, you couldn't get braces onto a grouse. I mean, <laughs> even if you're not talking about orthodonture, if you're just talking about regular braces, right, they about, don't have shoulders. How about a retainer? And, could, could well, they do you a could retainer? have a retainer, but they don't have shoulders. You might manage a small belt, okay? But there's and there's no way you would need braces and a belt. That's just silly. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine? I mean, it's bad enough that a grouse has to walk around in braces, but yeah. braces and well, belt. Wow. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's move on from this before we do irreparable damage 
additional irreparable damage to our reputation. Yes. We have a couple of folks that uh, you had the good fortune to run into in recent events. Yes, uh, yes, and neither one of them were seriously harmed, although... Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, well, R, R, R. Yeah, well, yes, and, and they sort of speak for themselves. And let's start with our pal uh, and fellow Baker Street Babe. You know, we are... Oh, we don't um, play that up enough, do we? We do not. We are Baker Street Babes. And and today I'm not feeling particularly babelicious, but I hope that next week I will. But uh, our <laughs> pal, Lindsay Fay has a new book, hmm. which... Uh, is published in partnership with Otto at the Mysterious Press. And I was lucky enough to go down to Otto's shop and spend some time with Lindsay. And rather than give you any further introduction, our whole interview is sort of self-explanatory, and it sounds a lot like this. Hello, my name is Lindsay Fay, um, Ash, BSI, Baker Street Babe, a curious collector, among other things. Um, and I write mystery novels. With Dust and Shadow in 2009, Lindsay Fay kicked off her career as a novelist, a career that now includes the three Timothy Wilde novels, which explore New York City in the middle of the 19th century, and Jane Steele, which reimagines Jane Eyre as a gutsy serial killer. She's continued to write about Sherlock Holmes through a series of short stories, now collected in The Whole Art of Detection, and I asked her about that journey. What I initially wanted to do, whenever I approached a short story, and um, ten of them were written for the Strand. So whenever I approached one, I thought to myself, which parts of the canon do I find, uh, where do I find the gaps in the map? Um, Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness style. Where's the unexplored bit where I can dive into this part of the chronology, and I think that it's maybe a little bit underrepresented, and I can talk about that. So this ended up spanning pretty much all of their lives together. And once I realized that I had written stories that had started, there are three of the stories in this collection that occur before Baker Street that are along the lines of The Adventure of the Gloria Scott, for instance. Um, there are ones that are the early years before Professor Moriarty came on the scene. There are the ones that really deal with the aftermath of Holmes's death and return. And there are the ones that are closer to 1902. And so when I picked the title The Whole Art of Detection, I also, of course, consulted Otto. But it seemed like something... That was um, evocative of how I chronologically tried to put these stories together as I wrote them over the course of about eight years. Successfully capturing the voice of these characters is a challenge, and she had some interesting thoughts about that. I do find very specific stylistic uh, quirks depending on what era of the canon I'm writing in. Um, if I'm going to sit down and write something from the early years, I'm probably going to read The Adventure of the Speckled Band before I, um, before I start tapping away at the laptop. If, on the other hand, I want to write something from much later in their partnership, I'm going to sit down and read The Illustrious Client or The Priory um, you know, School. And they really do sound different um, as Conan Doyle himself evolved as a writer. And all I'm trying to do is be a good mimic. So I didn't, I didn't evolve, but, um, but they certainly differ stylistically depending on what year they're being set in. And then, of course, I had to ask about plotting. Conan Doyle had remarked that he found plotting some of his stories uh, a real challenge. A tip of my chapeau to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The plots, absolutely. Um, coming up with the coming up with the plots is incredibly difficult, and sometimes it's a thought exercise where I approach it from um, what is a bizarre situation that's a theoretical situation, and I could then ask myself a bizarre question, and then I could come up with the best way possible of solving it, uh, whatever solution I could do. You almost always have to start with the end, otherwise it's extraordinarily difficult. So, for instance, I don't know if Sir Arthur Conan Doyle ever asked himself, what if you were asked to join a league of red-headed men? And that was a, a, a circumstance that you were faced with. Um, I asked myself, for instance, um, in The Adventure of the Mad Baritone, what would happen if the same person had been kidnapped from the streets of London three times, kept in a room all night, and then released entirely unharmed back onto the streets of London and then he had to account for this and he had to go to Scotland Yard and say I've been kidnapped three times and then let go and the yard says you're crazy and Sherlock Holmes says you're not crazy I'm going to figure this out so sometimes it starts with that and sometimes the plots evolve out of um, out of the characters because I want to 
find a situation that would elaborate more about the friendship and that would elaborate more about the relationships between um, not only Holmes and Watson, actually, but um, but Holmes and Lestrade, for instance, features uh, features really heavily in one of them. Um, what was Lestrade's opinion of Holmes vanishing for three years and not telling anybody? And then these are all quite close uh, co-workers, right? And then coming back and trying to fix the aftermath of that. So if I have a, a character-driven um, short story in front of me and I think, okay, this is, this is the inspiration for it, what kind of case would enable them to actually start these very reticent individuals, these highly British individuals, um, what would actually enable them to start having this conversation and what would crack that nut. And so um, it almost always starts one of those two ways. And the book's had a great reception. Um, it is already in a second printing and I'm flabbergasted, but um, but honored and humbled. And um, yeah, it's been amazing to watch. I, I actually didn't expect there to be a lot of notice for a short story collection, specifically just because the structure was that of a short story collection. And, you know, not even to be reviewed very much. And um, the reviews have all been so far incredibly flattering. And um, the fact that it's already gone into another printing is beyond my wildest dreams for um, having, you know, spent this amount of time over almost a decade now, having written the short stories, always with the idea that one day Otto and I would do this, that one day Otto Fempler and I would put together, you know, this collection, and that it would all live together, and it would have a couple new stories to boot. So, you know, there are two that have never previously been published before. So, um, yeah, I'm just thrilled by it, and very grateful. And there you are. Well, we are grateful, too. I mean, Lindsay really has a remarkable talent for capturing the voice and style of Conan Doyle and, and of Watson, obviously. Um, you know, and her, uh, her work has been uh, recognized again and again for its excellence. Uh, we know that um, she's been nominated, uh, I think, a couple of times for Edgar Awards. Um, yeah, at least Jane Steele, I know. Jane Steele most recently, yeah. And, um, geez, was there another one that was, uh, 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 uh maybe The Gods of Gotham, too. Yeah. Uh, another one, uh, one of the Timothy Wilde, uh, novels. Yeah. Uh, so she's, uh, she's just got a knack for period, uh, writing, uh, certainly at the novel level. And, and clearly this, uh, you know, the, this short story collection, the, the very fact that it is already in a second printing uh, indicates her ability there as well. You know, there's just been a a rebirth of interest in pastiches and particularly uh, in the same medium in which Conan Doyle originally published, the short story format. You know, we've seen it with the MX book of Sherlock Holmes stories, which is now, I think, up on uh, approaching its seventh volume. Uh, we we see it through uh, Otto's continued collection, you know, his big book series. Uh, of course, he did the big book of Sherlock Holmes stories uh, recently, but he's, you know, in episode 87, he talked with us about uh, the many big books that he does. Uh, so I think Lindsay was wise to hitch her wagon to Otto's star, or vice versa. Uh, and the two of them together, I think, make a um, just a powerful uh, pair when it comes to publishing Sherlockian short stories. But isn't that interesting, you know, thinking about plotting, um, that her starting point for some of these things was, you know, to think about improbable events. And I love that. I've got to read that um, uh, particular story in her new collection because I, I am happy to to have have it, but I have not had any time to read it yet. But that's very interesting about somebody who's kidnapped three times and returned unharmed to the streets of London. I think that's very clever. Hmm. And how interesting, you know, to recognize that the voice, voices change over time. And so yeah. if you're writing about something early in the relationship, to have a look at the speckled band, let's say. Um, really, really um, clever stuff. Absolutely. I think, I think clever is the perfect adjective to describe Lindsay. And you will find this of interest because... Uh, 
unfortunately, you know, it was pretty. There was a full house in Otto, so that my the recording there is pretty noisy in the background. But in the background, you can hear cocktails being shaken, <laughs> and Lindsay's husband Gabe, who is a uh, professional expert in the cocktail world, yes, was as he sometimes does serving cocktails, and he was serving his signature mystery cocktail, the Jezail Bullet. Ah. And after a couple of those, you can't tell the difference between your shoulder or your leg. <laughs> those, those jet sail bullets, they'll go right through you. Yeah. <laughs> and I found uh, out the secret ingredients of the jet sail bullet. What's that? Oh, I can't tell you. It's oh. a secret. <laughs> Lead. <laughs> That's what they serve up in Flint. <laughs> oh, uh. Excellent. Well, what a great time. To pause and reflect and hear from our good friends at the Baker Street Journal. The cult of Sherlock Holmes is really like a cult of personality in some ways. After all, isn't it because of the interesting main characters that we remain interested in the stories? The clients and minor players change from story to story, but it's Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson who are with us, tale after tale. And it's their unique personalities that drive our interest. The quirky, sometimes unpredictable behavior of Holmes. Will he retain that cat-like love of personal cleanliness? Or will the Baker Street rooms be strewn with plugs and dottles of his pipes and papers? And the stalwart, unflappable John H. Watson, M.D., who in so many ways represents us as we look at the strange world of which he's a part. But the cult of personality extends to the people we meet through this hobby. People like Lindsay Fay and Ed Pettit. People whose work you'll read in the pages of the Baker Street Journal. Quarter after quarter, year after year. Subscribers of the BSJ are treated to the inner workings of the minds of Sherlockians. And we're better off for that. Isn't it time that you exposed yourself to the many facets of Sherlockian writers from around the world? Visit BakerStreetJournal.com and get your passport stamped today. Well, and not to say that, uh, you know, that's not enough. You know, you want more for your money. I had a um, invitation some weeks ago. Well, actually, I attended an early meeting of a new Sherlockian group that uh, our pal Anastasia Klimchinskaya. That's easy and, for you to say. <laughs> no, it's not. And... <laughs> Her compatriots have started in beautiful Philadelphia. This is the ancient order of free Sherlockians. Oh. I love that. Can, uh, can a new group be an ancient order? Well, sure. We've just, uh, who knows how long it's been under the currents, you know, probably since the, oh, I don't know, 13th century, 14th century, <laughs> or if not under the currents, next to the dates, or probably over by the prunes. But uh, I think it has a long history. <laughs> of at least several months. And it's actually a terrific group. Steve and Janice Rothman were there. And, um. You mean Janice Fisher and Steve Rothman? Yes. Janice Fisher and Steve Rothman. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't it Steve Fisher and Janice Rothman? <laughs> I haven't gone fishing for Rothmans in a long time. <laughs> First of all, I can't get the filters on the end of the hook. All right. All right. Reel it in. <laughs> <laughs> And the game's afoot. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, how did I get started with this? Oh, the Ancient Order of Free Sherlockians <laughs> uh, had a meeting on Shakespeare's birthday, April 23rd, in conjunction with a wonderful talk given by one of the members of the Ancient Order, Ed Pettit, huh. um, in conjunction with the Rosenbach Libraries exhibition on crime, criminals, and things Sherlockian. And I had a lovely opportunity to talk for about 10 minutes afterwards with uh, the member of the Scion, Ed Pettit, uh, about the uh, exhibition and some of the really interesting things that are in there. Hmm. And this is a sort of a self-contained conversation that began with me asking him to introduce, uh, not unusually, asking him to introduce himself. Perfect. I'm Edward G. Pettit. I am the manager of public programs at the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. And what is the Rosenbach Library? 
The Rosenbach is a historic house and a collection of books uh, from the Rosenbach brothers, uh, Philip Rosenbach and A.S.W. Rosenbach, where uh, uh, antique dealers – Philip was the antique dealer and A.S.W. was the book collector. And they had a long-time book-selling business uh, in the uh, first half of the 20th century. A.S.W. Rosenbach was the most famous bookseller in the world, he was called at one point. And um, uh, when he died, he – they, they, he bequeathed the rest of his collection and the, you know, the unsold stock from the books into uh, a museum. And this is a, we're in a fabulous exhibition here called, tell us the title of it. And it's called Clever Criminals and Daring Detectives. And it's part of this whole project with the Free Library of Philadelphia called We the Detectives. And the Free Library and their rare book department has their own uh, exhibition called Becoming the Detective. And it's all about the history of not just criminal literature, but then the whole mystery detective fiction throughout the 20th century. There's also a uh, interactive uh, theatrical experience at the Free Library of Philadelphia called Gumshoe, uh, put together by a group called New Paradise Laboratories in Philadelphia. And it's an immersive experience where you go through behind the scenes of the library to solve this strange mystery about this manuscript from these Poe collectors and Rosenbach and is it real and where did it come from? And then it takes you from that location at the Free Library of Philadelphia down 20th Street about five or six blocks to our building. So this is something families could do uh, in an afternoon. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a, uh, a, the, the gumshoe is an hour and a half long, but you could also see the exhibit there first and then do the gumshoe or, or after and then come here. So yeah, it's a nice family event. And this is a remarkable survey of, of really crime, criminals and detection over the years. One of the things you mentioned in your remarks was how that focus on crime mirrored developments in society that in the early days, you were sort of expected to be found out by a higher providence, perhaps, but eventually there evolved sort of the profession of the detective. Can you talk a little bit about that sweep of time? Sure. I mean, and, and, and this exhibition started as a 17th century uh, text of a criminal biography, a crime that happened and who did it and how he was discovered. And then it goes through, you know, the 18th century uh, criminal biographies, things like the the, the 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 Newgate Calendar, which was published in America. I, I love that in America, uh, the, the the criminal publication was called the American Bloody Register, uh, and there are these great accounts of great. <laughs> they're the and they are they're they're enjoyable to read if you like this kind of you know uh, crime literature and crime stories. Um, but but the biggest difference is in them is that there seems to be this kind of you know providence at work that if you commit a horrific crime it will be discovered and criminals are caught and it's more uh, crimes are and criminals are revealed in in earlier centuries um and i think that's not just in the literature about it that's the way people felt that you would just it would come out that you revealed and and it kind of goes back to the you know uh, uh, the old story that you know if if you bring the criminal in front of their victim the murder victim that the that the that the corpse will bleed uh, in the presence of the person who did it that there's some some supernatural means at work and by the 19th century this stops uh, in the 19th century people are developing uh, societies are developing ways to catch criminals and methods of detection uh, and it's interesting that it all happens at the same t- and it happens in real life at the same time as the fictional detectives are being created uh, you know, in France with Emile Gaboriaux, I'm sure Lecoq, and and uh, and then in America with Edgar Allan Poe, C. Auguste Dupin, um, that these are detectives who are using reason and analysis to discover who committed a crime, and it's analysis and weighing evidence, and it's a scientific method that is able to catch criminals not some providential revelation. And one of the unique things about this exhibition is that you start with Poe, or you don't start with Poe, but you you center a good deal on Poe and have a rare opportunity to see an actual Poe manuscript. Yeah, we have two pages. The the Poe manuscript from The Murders in the Rue Morgue, which is the first mystery detective story written in the English language, um, uh, the Free Library of Philadelphia has that entire manuscript of 17 pages, and we, they've loaned us two pages of it, and they have some of the pages in, in their exhibit as well. Um, and the, it's a story that was originally called, and we know this only because of the manuscript, that it's, it's not 
called Murders in the Rue Morgue. It's called Murders in the Rue Trianon Bas. And then it's crossed off and Rue Morgue is written over it, which is a much better name for, you know, this murder story that he's written. Um, and, uh, and it's a beautiful hand. And, and not just because it needs to be a neat hand for the typesetter, but all Poe's handwriting is very neat in all his letters. So uh, it's uh, – and it's an amazing that this manuscript survived. Uh, it only survived because the – an assistant at the typesetters for the magazine where it was published takes it out of the trash – and takes it home, and it survives two fires, and it's doused with water, and it's thrown away, and it just and the owner just somehow manages to keep, you know, uh, to to, to uh, maintain possession even with all these calamities until it's finally sold to a book collector. Uh, um, by that time, by the late 19th century, by the 1880s, they realize a Poe manuscript is valuable, and it's the only uh, story manuscript of Poe's that has survived. Mm. And then you move on to Arthur Conan Doyle, who in his earliest writings acknowledged his indebtedness to Poe. He did, and he, and he acknowledges it in two ways, which is great because Doyle himself acknowledges it. He has this one great quote about, you know, uh, uh, we all follow in the footsteps of Poe, and Poe, you know, drops the seeds from which all, you know, so many kinds of literature grow. And Doyle, there's a lot of great Poe quotes from Doyle the writer, but also Sherlock Holmes uh, talks about Poe, or, or talks about uh, Auguste Dupin in his stories, uh, and Poe's detective, and how you know he's you know not as you know uh, uh, um, uh, that Sherlock is a better detective than Dupin. I think is is what he winds up talking about. So you get the double connection, and Doyle was um, very much indebted to Poe and knew it and admitted it that his greatest character, Sherlock Holmes, is based on or inspired by or has parallels with, because there are certainly differences between Sherlock Holmes and C. Auguste Dupin, um, but they're both detectives who are absolutely brilliant, who have a kind of assistant narrator, um, who don't think highly of the police and um, uh, and understand that, that the investigation, it's not really even about the crime or the solution, it's more about this process whereby it's, you know, discovered that, you know, fascinating way. And both detectives, Dupin and Holmes, love this, you know, uh, figuring out this analytical reasoning they can use to figure out how a crime was committed and who committed the crime. And in our exhibition, we have uh, part of the collection here at the Rosenbach. We have we have uh, uh, some Conan Doyle books and we all, and and. A.S.W. Rosenbach was a Doyle, uh, Conan Doyle collector. At one point, he had uh, he, he obtained Conan Doyle's uh, criminological library that he had put to, amassed over the years. And one of the things we have is we have the manuscript for uh, the Empty House, uh, which is the story right after Final Problem, where home the short story because Hound of the Baskervilles is in between, but the Empty House, Holmes returns um, and. Uh, um, Doyle bows to the pressure. Everyone wants more Sherlock Holmes stories, so he writes the empty house and uh, and the pages we have open to it, which is very nice, is the is the revelation in the story where Holmes reveals himself to Watson, and Watson says, "I fainted for the first and last time of my life." And you mentioned the Poe manuscript uh, surviving all these fires. You know, it sounds like it kept kept coming back again and again from the dead. And oddly enough, you end this exhibition with someone else who kept coming back and back from the dead, Dracula. There are notes here uh, from Bram Stoker. Yeah, uh, part of, one of the greatest parts of the, uh, of the Rosenbach collection is we have the notes uh, for Bram, Bram Stoker's notes for the novel Dracula. Uh, he wrote the Dracula, he researched and wrote the novel over the course of about seven years and uh and amass uh, you know a giant file of notes in doing that uh and we have those notes um which talk about their outlines and and ideas that uh, some of the things never made it into the book there's a whole list of characters from detectives to you know other characters who were named that he winds up not using it is interesting that he does have a detective at one point in his notes as a character and then doesn't use it um and i, I think it especially works with this exhibition because Part of Dracula's story is a detective story. It is a, you know, uh, uh, Van Helsing and, and Mina and Jonathan and, and Arthur and, and Dr. Se- can't forget Dr. Seward, um, investigating and finding out what Dracula is doing. I mean, the crime that has been committed, you know, and, and uh, how, you know, Lucy Westenra has been, you know, uh, 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 
uh, bitten by Dracula and and finding out where he is and where he stored his boxes. So there's a mystery part that goes on to that novel as well. And we have a few pages of the notes here that people can look at. People can look at those all the time too. Um, our collection's open to the public. You can set up an appointment at the Rose and Back and say, I'd like to see the Bram Stoker's notes. And we'd say, sure. And you can come in and we'll bring you up to the library, into the reading room, and we'll bring the notes out and you can look at them. And uh, we do hands-on tours every Friday in which we take out pieces of our collection and we have a Dracula one where you come up and, and I take out the, 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 the notes and not only do I explain them, but I pass them around. And it's a hands-on tour. You can actually handle these materials. Really? And this exhibition runs until when? This exhibition runs until uh, through August. I think September 1st or 2nd it might be. I'm not sure the exact date, but it runs through the summer. And then the same thing with the uh, free libraries uh, at the Rare Books Department there. I couldn't resist that sting at the end. What was that? It's a Creative Commons um, mystery sting that I found. Ah, Isn't it lovely? It is. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, we'll have to bring it back for some interviews. Yeah. But isn't that an interesting conversation? It's fascinating to see all this. And the whole thing is beautifully designed. You know, the typography, the graphics, the layout. Oh, I would uh, imagine. It was yeah. a very nice visit. And I'll tell you, one of the interesting things that Ed didn't mention is that there are letters there from Morley to Rosenbach and Rosenbach back to Morley. And apparently hmm. uh, one of the issues that they were writing about was our old friend Adrian Conan Doyle Uh-oh. had tumbled to the fact that this fellow Rosenbach apparently was in possession of his father's criminological library. Hmm. And <clears throat> Adrian uh, wanted the FBI to find out how it was stolen from the family. Well, so, so, you know, there are these letters back and forth between Morley and Rosenbach. And, uh, you know, Ro- Rosenbach, I mean, the tone of the letters was, you know, Adrian is a crackpot. I bought this at Sotheby's 15 years ago. You know, this was, this was uh, something the family, you know, put up for sale. Right, right. And so Morley was asking him, you know, send me a list of what's in there and so on and so forth. But I thought of that. When I went back recently and reread, I've been rereading some of the older Baker Street journals in the first series in 1948. Mm. And you'll, you'll appreciate this from the standpoint of Michigan. There's an entry here in um, volume three, number four of the Baker Street Journal. It's the Scion Report from the Amateur Mendicant Society of Detroit. Sure. And officers Russell McLaughlin. McLaughlin, sure. Yeah. And you get toward, towards the end of this. And the minutes say, the meeting then turned to consideration of the recent misadventure of Adrian Conan Doyle. Now, apparently this really happened. I I never heard about this, but Adrian Conan Doyle, who had been bitten by an adder on his Minstead estate, receiving no greater damage than a swollen arm. The adder was made the subject of one of the most complicated motions of the society in its parliamentary history. Uh, The motion carried three clauses. First, the adder was commended for a notable effort in the right direction. (laughs) Second, he was censured for having begun so well, ending so ineffectually. (laughs) And third, he was proposed for honorary membership in the Speckled Band of Boston, (laughs) the mendicants formally recognizing their lack of authority, but making the recommendation notwithstanding. Isn't good, that old, fun? good old amateur mendicants. They still retain their sense of humor locally here. Here, here. No, no question about that. Uh, well, oh, oh and um, I, I was delighted to hear once again of uh, Dr. Rosenbach um, applying his uh, his medical ministries to, uh, to to books rather than to patients. Yeah, you know, I hope to get one of my prescription re- prescriptions renewed, but he wasn't doing any of that. One He's I not a physician. <laughs> uh, good, good. Well, I think that uh, that about does it for our brace of interviews here. Uh, fascinating conversations with two very fascinating individuals. Mm. Uh, all that remains really is for folks to pony up head over to patreon and uh 
Look for I Hear of Sherlock there. Support us in any way that you see fit, or just hit that PayPal button right on IHearOfSherlock.com. We've had uh, some recent donations coming in, uh, and we do thank you for that, both for the Trifles podcast as well as for IHO's proper. Now, I have to ask you, did did the last... Remember the, our last podcast, I introduced a new spot. Did that have any help with donations? Uh, I... I th- I think it did actually. We we got a, a guffaw from Mary Miller. Oh, good. Um, and I believe we did get a um, a well intentioned donation after that. Oh, good uh, because uh, as a patron. Not not to push it too far. I do. Uh, I do have another one. Well, why don't you hang on to it for the next episode? Oh, okay. <laughs> we we don't want to overwhelm people. Okay, we'll, we'll pace ourselves. Okay, we'll pace good, ourselves. Good. Hey, maybe, maybe we'll think about releasing it if we get more patrons. Oh, that's a good idea. Huh? Huh? Well, that's a very huh? good idea. Oh, and there's always something from the Sherlock Holmes brand universe to listen to. Always. Friends, energy and the environment are critical issues. And sometimes the oldest ideas are the best. Electric cars are just big batteries on wheels. When it comes to stylish and politically correct transportation, you need the new Sherlock Holmes brand Handsome Cab. It's the only Handsome Cab that delivers the three C's. Comfortable, cobblestone, conveyance, conveyance. It's good to your pocketbook and peace of mind. It's made of renewable American oak and maple with vegan-friendly faux leather trim. It's powered by water and hay, so it produces free fertilizer with every kilometer you cover. So slow down and travel the handsome, handsome way with the new Sherlock Holmes brand Handsome Cab. Available at your local Sherlock Holmes brand retailer today. That's a good looking cab. The nice thing is if you have one of these in New Jersey, you can wave to the people you pass on New Jersey Transit as you head towards New York. (laughs) But what if you're traveling miles instead of kilometers? Oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't <laughs> oh, only... oh, yeah. What a shame. It's got it's got a handle with two settings: go and stop. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we thank the Sherlock Holmes brand for its continued sponsorship mm. here at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. And until we gather here next time, mid month, I will be forced to remain. Scott Monty. And waiting for the bell as usual, I'm Bert Walder. Ding, ding, ding. Ha <laughs> ha the, the game's afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.